folks, Dr. Rob Barrington here with some more nutrition advice. Um, I wanted to talk today about vitamin D. Um, in the United Kingdom now, we're in midwinter, uh, it's January, um, the Northern Hemisphere is experiencing uh, its, its winter months. Uh, so vitamin D uh, is, is very relevant because um, people are becoming aware that vitamin D, uh, during the winter, uh, vitamin D levels drop uh, significantly. And uh, studies have shown that this, this fall in vitamin D uh, exposes us to uh, a higher risk of many uh, diseases, uh, particularly Western lifestyle diseases, including cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, and um, also um, obesity and, uh, and, and diabetes. So I think uh, there, is a, there is a general awakening uh, amongst the, uh, you know, the, the general population uh, as to the importance of vitamin D. I know a lot of people um, who uh, are not really um, that interested in nutrition who do take vitamin D, and I think um, generally, um, you know, that there, this 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 awareness that vitamin D during the winter needs uh, needs to be addressed through supplementation um, at high latitudes, uh, I think, has has come uh, has, has managed to effectively trickle down from the research into the you know the mainstream um, media domain. Uh, and that's good because, um, you know, vitamin D is a, a steroid hormone. It has a lot of cell regulatory effects uh, and therefore you would expect it to have a, a large effect on, uh, you know, cellular biochemistry and physiology. Um, what I wanted to talk specifically about today um, was um, testing for vitamin D. Uh, I've covered blood tests before. Um, I'm just going to bring up quickly uh, a table that I've produced that shows... Um, the levels of vitamin D, um, the current, um, you know, estimates for levels of vitamin D uh, in the blood. Um, and uh, I just want to go through that to show um, for information purposes um, the, the types of ranges that we're talking about. So here's the table. Um, if we have a look at the table, what we see is that um, there are two measures of vitamin D. There are nanograms per mil and there are nanomoles per litre. Uh, so it's very careful that you, uh, it's very important that you know which uh, unit you're talking about. To convert nanograms per mil into nanomoles per litre, all you need to do is take the number and multiply it by 2.5. So 10 nanograms per mil multiplied by 2.5 is 25 nanomoles per litre. Um, so that, that's the first caveat really, you need to be uh, aware that um, there are two different measures, so don't, don't get caught out with that. Uh, but if we have a look at this table, these measures are actually of 2,5-hydroxy vitamin D, and 2,5-hydroxy vitamin D is the active metabolite of vitamin D uh, in uh, humans, in the, in the plasma, uh, and it's the accepted biomarker for vitamin D status. So when you have your blood test uh, uh, performed, you would have your 2,5-hydroxy vitamin D uh, levels uh, 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 measured. Um, so really we've got a number of different vitamin D, uh, there's, a, there's a number of different ways of classifying vitamin D status. What we, where we want to be really is in the normal range, which is above 30 nanograms per uh, milliliter. Um, if, we, if our levels drop below the 30, we become at risk of an insufficiency, which is not an outright deficiency. So it would be unlikely that we would develop uh, osteomalacia, um, or rickets if we were an adult or a child respectively uh, but we would be at much higher risk of the diseases I mentioned earlier including uh, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease uh, and cancer and there are many others multiple sclerosis is always also associated with um, with vitamin D. As levels drop further and they drop below 20 uh, nanograms per mil uh, we do become uh, it, we do we do effectively have a vitamin D deficiency um, now, interestingly, many people in the population do actually have levels that low, uh, and there are many studies that have measured um, apparently healthy people with vitamin D levels that low. Uh, they are at much higher risk of certain diseases, um, but you know, in in certain people, even at that level, um, uh, in the short term, uh, the 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 symptoms are not um, you know what as severe as you would expect. 
but when we drop below 10 nanograms per mil we become uh, we fall into the severe deficiency uh, category um, and that's where you would expect um, you know significant and substantial effects to um, calcium homeostasis and uh, bone formation to occur um, and you would actually be at, uh, you know even in the short term you would be at quite high risk um, of developing uh, you know a, a number of different disorders and diseases um, so this is just a you know a table I wanted to put you know, put up there. You can pause the video. You can have a look at this table. Um, there are slight variants uh, variations on on the ranges. Some research um, uses slightly different ranges, but this is just a, a table I've put together from um, you know a number of different sources, uh, and this is a, a rough uh, you know a rough estimate of, of the kind of levels of vitamin D that you need. Um, you can overdose on vitamin D, obviously. Uh, vitamin D uh, above uh, vitamin D, 2 5 hydroxy vitamin D levels in your blood above uh, about uh, 150 uh, nanograms per mil uh, is where uh, the level of overdose um, would begin. Um, and as levels obviously increase further, uh, the, the risk of toxicity uh, in increases further as well. So the reason I brought this table up is because it's very difficult to actually determine what your plasma levels are, your blood levels are, unless you've had a, a blood test. Uh, and obviously in a research setting, um, or if you think you're at severe risk of vitamin D uh, deficiency, um, you may have access to these tests. You know, they, the, the doctors can order vitamin D tests. Uh, and in a research setting, uh, these tests are done quite routinely. They're not that difficult. They're usually done um, through um, a sample of blood that's put on um, something called an ELISA test, which is a, a, a very simple um, and very quick way of testing um, for 2,5-hydroxy vitamin D levels. Um, um, it's quite routinely done. It's not difficult, but it can be quite expensive. Uh, and ge the general population, uh, you, you know, doesn't have access to these types of uh, of tests in order to be able to monitor their uh, vitamin D levels. Um, and therefore, you know, if you are aware that you may need supplements, there is a lot of guesswork involved. And I have covered this in other videos. You know, trying to give a range of uh, of, of of you know of vitamin D that you might want to take in order to be able to uh, prevent. Uh, the risk of you falling into those in that insufficient uh, category. Um, general recommendations uh, at the moment uh, vary, but anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000 IU of vitamin D per day um, during the winter months seems to be, uh, you know, from what I've read about the consensus on the amount of vitamin D supplements that you know, a, a normal gene a genetically normal person may require, and that will be based on a number of, of, of you know of different um, uh, variables, depending, including you know um, biochemical individuality, sunlight exposure, various other things. But during during the winter, uh, you, depending on which hemisphere you're in, that will obviously you know the, the time will, will differ. But during your winter months, when you don't have access to the sun. Um, so I'll give the example of the northern hemisphere, you know, perhaps from about October, um, certainly by the end of October, all the way perhaps through to March, um, I would suggest that vitamin D supplements um, are required. Outside of those times, uh, I don't personally take vitamin D, uh, but I do make sure that um, uh, you know, I try to go into the, in the sun every day in order to be able to top up my levels and and if you look at the research that's that's really uh, reflected in the research vitamin d levels start to drop uh, in the autumn uh, so about october time and then they start to rise again uh, in the spring in the late spring as the sun uh, becomes uh, more intense so that is a rough estimate um, and the recommendations are up to you know up to 2000 iu um, but some some research papers are now suggesting that even that is not high enough and therefore the range is somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 IU during those winter months. So obviously adjust that for the months if you're in the southern hemisphere when you've got your winter and that's a you know that's a general recommendation but even that is a you know is, is a guesstimate. So it's a very you know it'd be a very useful um, a very, it'd be very useful if we had some way of estimating our um, vitamin D levels without having to have a blood test. And I came across um, a study that had actually validated uh, a questionnaire method for estimating 
um, your plasma 2,5-hydroxy vitamin D uh, levels. And it was based on uh, a number of different questions. And these questions had come from other studies that had shown associations between particular variables and the amount of um, the amount of 2,5-hydroxy vitamin D in your blood. And they used something, uh, st a statistical method called linear regression. Uh, they created uh, correlations. They, they used a lot of statistics to be able to come up with a, a, a simple questionnaire that people could uh, have a look at questions, create a score, so you'd create a, a total vitamin D score, and then you would rate that score against uh, a, a different uh, ranges uh, of, um, uh, of, of figures uh, in order to be able to assess uh, how, how at risk you were for developing a vitamin D insufficiency. So that insufficiency would be dropping below the 30 nanogram per mil uh, level into the 20 to 30 nanogram per mil category. Um, so if I bring that, uh, I will bring that um, uh, questionnaire up now and you can have uh, obviously have a look at it and you can pause the video if you want to, you know, uh, take a screenshot of it to save it. Um, it will be going up at some point on uh, on my blog, so I will uh, probably retrospectively put a link uh, in the video below so you can have access to it. But it's uh, there. I will certainly put a link to the paper and, and therefore you can get this off the original paper and you can read the paper to see uh, how they went about this method because it's quite interesting uh, and I think it's quite informative as well so I'll definitely put the link to the paper below and any of the links that become uh, you know useful and I think will will we'll supplement this video I'll also put in the comments box below this video um, so let's have a look at that uh, let's have a look at that uh, you know that questionnaire quickly and bring it up um, if we have a look at the categories what we've effectively got um, is we've got uh, a, a male and female, so they've, they've split the two sexes. Um, they've also put in a, a consideration for your body mass index, which is what BMI, BMI stands for. Um, and, and that is relevant because um, uh, uh, those people who have a higher uh, body mass index, those people that are generally overweight or obese, tend to have lower plasma levels of 2,5-hydroxyvitamin D. Um, now, the purpose of this, these scores that you see on the uh, against each of these categories, uh, you're going to add, you're going to go through these categories, and you're going to score yourself based on, uh, you know, uh, what you are uh, in relating to these categories. So, if you're a man, you rate yourself as male. Your score for that category is zero. Then you go down to the weight status, the BMI, uh, and if you have a body mass index of less than 25, um, which most normal weight people uh, will be in that category, again, you score zero. So you're adding these categories up as you go down. Um, you'll do physical activity. So if you do more than one hour per day, you know, walking equivalent, again, your score is zero. So you've got down to there. If you're a man with a body mass index of less than 25 and you perform, you know, equivalent of, of, of more than one hour's walking uh, per day, your score by the end of the third category is zero. Um, then there is a, a there is a, a, um, a, a you know a category for the latitude that you live in, uh, and that's important because obviously because of the sun. So if you are you know if you're in the northern latitude uh, above 48 degrees north, um, your score is uh, is zero. But if you're lower than 48 degrees north, um, your score is two. Um, so uh, sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. If you're below um, 48 degrees north, your uh, score is zero. If you're above 48 degrees north, your score would be two. Um, then the seasons obviously relates to the sun as well. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you're getting a higher score um, during uh, the, the times when uh, the uh, the sun is perceived to be less intense. So February to March, uh, there's there's very little uh, in northern latitudes. There's very little, uh, you know, sun. So uh, you get a higher score, and you get the idea as you go through. And then obviously the sun exposure as well. Um, and then there is a, uh, a a category for how uh, you know how dark your skin is and how you respond to the skin in terms of your tanning. Um, so and all these categories have been uh, you know have come from research in terms of the correlations they show uh, with. Uh, uh, the plasma levels of 2,5-hydroxyvitamin D. And what these researchers found is if you have a score uh, that is between 7 and 9, um, you are at a moderate risk of uh, developing uh, a vitamin D insufficiency. Um, so if your score is less than 7, um, you are likely, uh, and it doesn't say, it's not obviously categorical it doesn't it doesn't um, determine that you won't have a, a risk but it, it, your risk is less 
So this is this is obviously not a measurement, it's an estimate. Uh, so therefore it should be taken in that context. So if you have a score of less than seven, um, your risk of um, a vitamin D, of having a vitamin D insufficiency is low. Um, if you have a score between seven and nine, your risk of having a vitamin D uh, insufficiency is moderate. And if you have a score above nine, um, your risk of having a vitamin D in, uh, insufficiency uh, is high. Um, and you could use that, for example, as um, you know a guide as to whether you feel that you require um, supplements. And you could do this questionnaire at different times of the year because obviously there is a variation based on uh, the time of the year. Uh, and therefore, this score will vary uh, at different times of the year. So this would uh, reflect the, the, the need for supplementation likely uh, in the winter. Uh, and obviously, if you move geographically and you move uh, further south, if you're in the northern hemisphere and you move further to closer to the equator, uh, your score will change again because you're 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 moving uh, past that 48 degrees north latitude point. That's the cutoff point uh, in this in this scoring system. So this is quite a useful little way to uh, estimate uh, and, and predict whether you are likely to be at risk of a, a vitamin D, uh, a vitamin D insufficiency. So you know, as I say, I'll put the link to this paper uh, in the comments box below uh, this video, so you can have a look at it. I just thought I'd throw this out there. I, I came across it. I thought it was very, uh, a very neat, very easy way um, to, uh, to to assess your vitamin D status. And like I say, this this was validated against blood levels. Uh, and therefore this um, this is you know scientifically robust it's not a perfect system obviously blood vessel but blood um, tests are still the best way of assessing your 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels but if you don't have access to blood uh, tests and you, you don't want to have a blood test uh, but you do want some way of assessing your risk this is quite um, a fun way and quite an interesting way of finding uh, finding out which category you likely uh, belong to um, so eat well protect yourself and stay healthy uh, and I will see you soon for another video. And in the meantime, please take care.